Uh, my name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're the Indiana Voice for Peace, Justice, Human Rights, and Intercultural Encounter. We're really delighted today to welcome our friend, Pastor Carrie Ballinger, pastor of the English-speaking congregation of the Lutheran Church of the Redeemer in the old city of Jerusalem. So Carrie, welcome. It's good to see you. It's good to catch up with you. Uh, even with all the unrest in our country, Carrie, we've been thinking very much of you and our friends in Palestine and Israel. I know you have many friends here on the uh, interview uh, today. So tell us, how are you doing in these strange COVID days? And have you been able to stay safe and healthy these last weeks? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Uh, it's great, great to see all your faces and to connect with you this way. Uh, I'm doing fine. And that first of all, thanks for asking about that. I've been healthy. Um, I've been able to stay safe in my home. I was quarantined for the first couple of weeks because I did come in contact with a, a visiting pastor here. It was uh, the last one of the last tour groups here before everything shut down and he, uh, that pastor uh, had the virus. And so I did spend two weeks in total quarantine, uh, but uh, I've been really healthy and um, except for the fact that my pants don't fit anymore because I baked bread for two months straight. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, other than that, I'm doing fine. <laughs> I wasn't aware that you uh, had been in contact with one of the uh, COVID carriers uh, in, in uh, the Holy Land. Yeah, unfortunately, this was a, a, a pastor from Minnesota and he was here, um, visited me with a large group, church group, and the next day they flew home and he tested positive. And so then I, they informed me, and unfortunately that pastor uh, passed away of the virus a couple of weeks later. So, um, you know, I think there's hardly any, any one of us that hasn't been connect, connected or touched in some way by, by this sickness. And um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, yeah, that was a sad ending to that story. Oh my, oh my. Yeah. That must've been in the very early days. I mean, if they it were was. able to return, if they were able to return, because the Bethlehemite, the Bethlehem tourist groups were quarantined there, right? Right. So the West Bank was was on lockdown as of March the fourth. Um, we had service on March eighth, and then I met with this group on March twelfth, and it was just right after that that we found out that that pastor was positive, and it just you know as, as, here things just went really quickly after that, and we. Uh, and the country shut down. Sure. Quickly, yeah. I wanted to say thanks to uh, to you, Carrie, for uh, coming in. It's, it's nine o'clock at your time, and uh, you're looking pretty chipper for being uh, nine o'clock at night. I just want to tell you. Thank you. <laughs> we'll see how it goes in an hour. <laughs> what Good. I'm looking. Good. Well, we'll we'll uh, honor our time restraints. Hey, uh, uh, be before I ask you about. Uh, your, your uh, role in assisting the Lutheran bishop there, I, I wanna ask you about your parish uh, work. Uh, you're, you're an ordained minister in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, assigned to do ministry in one of the most troubled parts on the planet in a context of three global faiths, the place where Christianity began, a wash with Jesus sites, a congregation of ind indigenous Palestinian Christians but also others from around the world working in the region for uh, periods of a few years. In normal times, welcoming guests from the global Christian community, activists, scholars, archeologists, and other Christians who worship with you on Sunday mornings. Oftentimes, more than half of the congregation are your guests in normal times. Uh, this is a crazy eclectic group of people to whom you're ministering and in a crazy, eclectic, and wonderful and challenging place. Uh, I want to just give you an opportunity to talk to us about what ministry is like in a, in a place like that and with people like this. Hmm. Well, the way you describe it, I, I 
think, wow, what, I can't believe I do all of that. But you're, you're, pretty, you're pretty amazing. You're pretty oh, wow. Amazing. Uh, it's a really, it is a really interesting ministry. And, you know, I, I went to seminary and thought that I wanted to do urban ministry. And I did my um, internship and field education in uh, urban Chicago. And then I was called to a rural congregation in a town of 900 people as my first call. And then I was senior pastor of a large, wealthy Chicago suburban church. Um, and then I came here and, you know, talk about different, totally different contexts. All of those are very different. But I think uh, at the end of the day, as weird as this congregation is, and I'll talk more about that, um, people are people. And all the skills that I used in rural ministry and urban ministry and suburban ministry are really fundamentally the same in that we really it's about connecting with people hearing their stories um walking with people in what wherever they're at and uh, hearing and you know uh, hearing their stories and getting to know about their lives so that's what I do here just as I did in a small town Capron Illinois um now there are some things that are really unique and interesting about this congregation as you said uh, we have sometimes as, as many as half of the congregation as visitors. And those are people who are just coming, um, like some of you who have been to Redeemer as uh, pilgrims and tourists. Uh, but the ones that are there, the other half, uh, they are also very transient. So a lot of our congregation are people that are just there for three months at a time. They're here to volunteer, to study, uh, for sabbatical. Uh, something like that. So I, I have to really connect with people quickly. And so I often say when people come to church that the way you become a member is you come twice. And that really is how we do it. We don't have membership classes. We don't even have membership roles. Just if you come twice, you're, you're now uh, an, an official member. And then I always joke that if you come three times, you're probably going to be on the church council. And it's not much of a joke, actually, because uh, <laughs> we we really have to just incorporate people right into the life of the community and into leadership uh, almost immediately. Um, I really love that because I, you know, I remember being senior pastor of Bethany Lutheran in Crystal Lake, Illinois, and we had a whole hospitality team, uh, people who were in charge of following up with visitors and uh, taking a loaf of bread to their home or sending a postcard or uh, making sure they got a coffee mug with our website on it, right? We all do these things to try to um, get people to come back. Uh, but here I know that most of the people that walk through the door are never going to come back. And so we have the freedom to just practice hospitality for the sake of hospitality, just welcoming everyone and having them be a part of the community. We don't have members and non-members. We just really have Redeemer. Whoever comes through the door that day is Redeemer Church. And I find that really freeing uh, and wonderful. I wanted to ask you uh, um, um, about the other part of your job. Uh, I'll give you a chance to talk about your work with uh, the bishop, uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Jordan and the Holy Land. It, it's probably one of the denominations that has one of the most, it's a small denomination with a with a big name, you know, with a, with a, yeah. with a large, large name. Um, but because of its history and geography, it's, its witness is really great. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about the uh, ELCJHL, uh, but all in the, con you know, as itself, then in the context of the lar larger Lutheran world, world church, the global Lutheran church, and then also as part of the larger Palestinian Christian community. Mm -hmm. So could you say a word about your work mm -hmm. with the bishop, but in, in the context of the larger church? Right, so I, I'm sent here as a missionary through the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, but I'm sent to accompany the ELCJHL, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land. Um, and so half of my job is pastoring this English speaking international congregation. And the other half of my job is assisting Bishop Ibrahim Azar, who is a Palestinian Christian and the Bishop of 
the ELCJHL. And, and in that role, I'm helping him to write sermons and speeches and uh, official statements, anything that he really needs to do in English. My job is to um, help to communicate his ideas and messages out to the English speaking world. Um, the ELCJHL is a small church. It is only about 2,500 members spread across seven congregations. So we are very small. And if you think about that, um, we are in direct relationship with the ELCA um, and the ELCA has how many congregations? I think 9,300 congregations, something like that. And we have seven. <laughs> Uh, however, we make a really big impact on Palestinian society here, and that's mostly through our schools. We have four Lutheran schools, which are in Beit Jala, Bethlehem, and Beit Sahur, and Ramallah. Uh, our schools have more than 3,000 students, so we have more students than we have members of our congregations. What's, uh, the, uh, what's the percentage of Muslim and Christian in those schools? Well, it depends on the town. So in Beit Sahur, which is still a pre predominantly Christian town, uh, about 70% of the students are Christian and 30% are Muslim. But in Ramallah, I would say more than 90% of the students in the Lutheran school are Muslim students. And that reflects the makeup of the town, actually. So, um, and I think Bethlehem now is about 50 50. Um, so we, but these are Lutheran schools and the kids have um, Christian education. However, they also, the Muslim students have uh, a Muslim teacher who comes in for their religious ed classes as well. And then once a month, the Christian and Muslim students have a religious ed class together where they learn about each other's religion, which I think- Maria, I want you to, I want you to continue talking about the, uh, the uh, uh, ELC, JHL, in regard to the larger church, but as long as you're talking about schools, my what I know about Christian schools in Israel and Palestine is that because I don't know if it's because of socioeconomic levels or whatever it might be, but really they, they train future leaders, political leaders, the the the, prof, the, the medical professionals and legal professionals, uh, uh, religious leaders. I mean. A lot of the a lot of the leaders in Palestinian civil society come out of the Christian schools. Has been the history, hasn't it been? Yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, we have very good schools, and um, for sure, Muslim parents are eager to send their kids to to Christian schools. I mean, there's a couple there are a couple things that are good. We have wonderful curriculum. We have wonderful teachers. Uh, we also have. Uh, co-educational schools. So boys and girls are learning side by side. And I think that there's a recognition that that's, that's good and, and different from many places in the Middle East and even here in the Holy Land. Um, I think there, there was a study done a few years ago in, in Palestine that showed one in five people in Palestinian society have somehow been affected or gone through, uh, affected by or gone through our Lutheran schools. Wow. One in five people. So really, that's a huge impact that we have, um, even though we're a small, small church. You want to say something about uh, um, uh, the Lutheran Church uh, uh, in the region in connection with the other Christian denominations there, the, the larger Christian community in uh, the Holy Land? Well, so... Christians are only about one and a half percent of the population in all of Israel and Palestine, one and a half percent. So Christians as a whole are a, an extreme minority. And then Protestant Christians are a tiny minority of that minority. You know, most of the Christians in this place are uh, Roman Catholic or Greek Orthodox or some other variety of Eastern religion. So we have uh, Syrian Orthodox, Greek Catholics, Armenians, um, just about every uh, Ethiopian Christians, Ethiopian Orthodox. So we have many, many different um, Christian church bodies, and so we're a small denomination, and we're the, and we are relating to all of these other bodies um, ecumenically. Uh, but we have some differences, and and one of the main differences is me 
Yeah, um, <laughs> I was going to ask, <laughs> so, ask you about that. Yeah, so none of the other churches here ordain women at this time. Um, the Anglican Church does not ordain women in this diocese. That's right. And that is unusual in the Anglican Church worldwide. Um, but the Jerusalem Diocese is, is allowed to um, have that difference. And, and I could talk more about that later. Um, until this last year, um, the Lutheran Church also had not ordained women here. But in September, Bishop Azar ordained Maria Lepakari, who's from Finland. And she's been working here for five years as the director of the Swedish Theological Institute and had been prepared for ordination for years and just had never done it. And Bishop Azar stepped up and said, we want to ordain you. Um, and that was really wonderful. Of course, she's not local. You know, this is a, an, an international Finnish woman. However, Bishop Azar's daughter, Sally Azar, is in seminary right now. And she will, inshallah, be ordained in about a year and a half as the first Palestinian woman um, ordained to, to ministry here. So that's very, very exciting. Although there aren't, uh, let me just follow up with that. Uh, although there aren't other denominations that ordain women in the region, do you have any other professional clergy colleagues from other denominations with whom you could have a joint Bible study or, 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 you know, in terms of sermon preparation or other colleagues, pastoral colleagues who you relate with? Yes. Um, Tuesday mornings, we have a morning prayer service that I run at Redeemer, and then we follow that up with a Bible study. And initially, I had intended that to be for the congregation, but it turned into a pastoral text study. And that brings in really the international pastors who are here. So we have a, pa a pastor at the Scottish Church who comes. Um, we had a UCC pastor and a, a Methodist colleague, Presbyterians. Most of them have gone now, either because of budget cuts or because of COVID, <laughs> unfortunately. But we still get together um, right now. That Tuesday morning text study and prayer is me and my Presbyterian colleague from the U.S. and um, Victor Macari's wife, Sarah. I don't know if it's Victor. Um, so it's sometimes the three of us. But we figure where two or three are gathered, we're... Uh, <laughs> We heard that God is present. I read that somewhere. <laughs> uh, was was the UC, was the UCC colleague Lauren McGrail by any chance? When yes. She was, yeah. Yes. But 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 I didn't hear you say anything about any of the indigenous church clergy part of that. Uh, yeah. Uh, let me. Yeah. Let me tell you about. Uh, I didn't talk much about the congregation. So there are seven congregations in the ELCJHL. Um, and mine which is English speaking. And then the other six are Arabic speaking congregations. Um, and we have all male pastors right now, soon to change. Um, know that most of the, they don't really come to my text study because they're um, Arabic speaking and because they have their hands full um, and most of them are on the other side of the wall. Um, so they're in they're yeah. in West Bank. And yeah. it's quite quite an ordeal to get from there to Jerusalem. Uh, just for a Tuesday morning text study. Many of us uh, here have worshiped with you, Carrie, uh, on a Sunday mornings. And those of us who've been privileged enough to prepare sermons here, those of us who are clergy here, um, know a little bit about the process of crafting sermons. Um, talk a little bit about your process of crafting a sermon that takes into account the international nature of your congregation. Uh, that doesn't flinch from Israeli injustices, that's sensitive to the concerns of your Palestinian families, but that's most important, but the most important thing, that it's gospel. Mm. That, 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 you know, that it's the gospel of Jesus. Just talk a little bit about that because you tend, you, you, you do it and you do it well. Mm. Well, thank you. That's nice to say. Um, I I think that, um, well, I don't know how different it is from anyone else's process, but I can tell you my process. I mean, I, I begin really in scripture, and I, I always think of um, a book about preaching that I read in seminary, and I, I can't remember now 
who it was, which book it was. But the, pre, the, the author said, you know, it's always important to read scripture and not ask, not ask the Bible, how can I preach you? But to let the Bible preach to you first. And I, I think that's a good place to start because I think when you're preaching every week, um, sometimes you can read the text and just be instantly thinking, oh, how am I going to make this interesting? Or what do, what do I have to say? And first, if you start with what, what is scripture saying to, to me, if I start there, then that's, um, that's usually a much better sermon. <laughs> um, and then I, I make sure that I have the text with me. I print it out and I carry it with me. And I'm thinking about it all week long as I'm going through the old city of Jerusalem, as I'm ministering to people, as I'm talking to uh, shopkeepers, paying attention to the news. And uh, that's how I'm able to, to sort of make sure that scripture is, is a living word in this context today. Um, but it requires paying attention and, and really having that in my mind all the time. I, you know, I, um, I think it's important to name where we see evil in the world and where we see uh, sin and where we see injustice. Uh, otherwise, it's really hard for me to understand how it's good news. If we don't know really what, what do we need good news? What, what do we need to be um, hearing liberation from? You know, what do we, what is going on in our lives that we need the good news for? And um, so I do name the, the realities here. Um, I talk about occupation. I talk about the wall. I talk about racism um, and violence. I think it's important that we name those things. Uh, I did, when I came here the first year, 20, 2014, was just when the, the Gaza war was going on. And um, I stood up and I preached and I said, some, I said the word occupation. <laughs> and we had a, a, an organist at the time, our pianist, who was very angry with me. And when she came out the, the, at the door after the service, she said, you can't say that word in a sermon. And I said, well, I certainly can because I just did. <laughs> and she said, well, you can't do that. And um, the sermon had been about bearing the cross. And I said, well, I think it's important that we notice where people in the world are, are carrying the cross and who among us is, is carrying the cross today. And she said to me, the musician said to me, your sermons are the cross I have to bear, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was pretty funny. She, she wasn't the pianist very much longer at the church after that. <laughs> <laughs> are there, uh, are there things, are, are, is there a language you can't use? Have you found, for example, uh, or, or does it have to be very contextual? I guess I'm asking, can, can you become, can you, can you be a proponent of BDS and still mm -hmm. remain in the country? I mean, can you, you, you get, you get what I'm asking. Are there things you can't say, uh, can't propose, or do you have to couch it in a certain kind of language? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, first of all, on the, the issue of BDS, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't talk about that from the pulpit because it is not a tactic or a strategy that the ELCJHL endorses. And I'm here at the invitation of the bishop of the ELCJHL, and I'm here to accompany their church. I'm really, at the end of the day, I'm a visitor in this place. And so I'm always careful not to um, step into things that are not my, my, my place in that way. Um, so the, neither the ELCA nor the ELCJHL endorse BDS. That's important to say. Um, yeah. uh, but I think the other thing is when you say, how to be careful. I mean, one of the struggles I have, and I'm doing, this is a struggle for me right now, as a matter of fact, is um, I'm American. And so I see things through American eyes. And right now, of course, I'm very focused and paying attention to what's happening in the US. You know, this is, this is heartbreaking for me to see what's going on. At the same time, kind of exciting, because I think what's, what's happening is something, is this, is this a big moment? But when I stand up and I preach here in Jerusalem, that is not the primary concern in this place. 
you know, there are Americans in my congregation, but most of them are not American. And the present reality here is occupation and right now the, the threat of annexation, which uh, is, is set to happen in a few weeks. And so sometimes that's a challenge where I have to remind myself that I can't stand up and, and preach from, from my perspective all the time. I have to try to understand. Um, uh, last week I did, I talked about George Floyd, but I was connecting right. it to, to what was happening here as well. It has to, somehow we have to uh, be able to preach to everyone in the pews. Yeah, I uh, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, um, uh, uh, Palestinian liberation theology and Black Lives Matter. I, I want to hold that off for just a minute, though, because last week you well, or maybe you want to fold it in because last week in your sermon you talked about I call it the evil eye or the all-seeing eye, but but you talked about your experience with that. Uh, seeing that was it in a monastery in Egypt was it or is it somewhere and uh but but then you but then you it was reinterpreted for you as your god's eye view of the world and that opened up a whole new possibility and then you wove in in your sermon uh uh the George Floyd incident as well as the Palestinian struggle you want to say a word about that uh, but but in, in the context of maybe Palestinian liberation theology if that informs does that inform your theology at all in your preaching? Sure. I mean, um, I've been really fortunate to sit with Christian leaders here and to hear how they, uh, how Palestinians interpret scripture. And I'm uh, part of that is being involved with Sabil Liberation Theology Center here. And um, I've had the chance to sit with Naima Tik and to um, actually to help write some articles for them for their, their magazine. And, you know, I think um, I was really fortunate that I graduated from Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago, which and learned a lot about liberation theology anyway at that institution. And so it was kind of natural to fold um, Palestinian liberation theology in into that. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of a specific instance. I, I guess what I would say is when I, um, for example, when I was assisting Bishop Munib Yunan, who was is the retired bishop of the ELCJHL, um, I assisted him for the first three and a half years I was here. Um, he often would talk about the struggles that Palestinians have with the Old Testament. And um, that was new to me to think about that. And he said, you know, that's it's difficult because of course we, we um, proclaim that God's word is there in all of scripture in the Old Testament and the New Testament, but that as a Palestinian, it's a great challenge to find good news in the script in these of uh, the Hebrew scriptures, which are often used today in the modern world to oppress um, Palestinians. So that's something that I've been learning more and more about uh, the struggles and then how the Lutheran church and the pastors here have been working against that and trying to work with their congregations to have a different relationship with the Hebrew scriptures, um, undoing some of the, the things that ha have happened um, for them spiritually since 1948. So uh, that's that's a piece of learning for me. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I'm still, I'm on a, pro I'm in a process with that. You know, I think every time I sit down and, and have the chance to hear a Palestinian Christian interpret scripture, I, it, it changes my theology and enriches it. Opens up, open up, opens up new worlds, new worlds of meaning. Yeah. I mean, when I first started helping Bishop Munib to, um, to work on sermons and I'm, you know, I was brand new here and very excited to help him. And he would say, well, so here's this, here's the text we have. Um, and then he would say, what do you think we should say, Carrie? And I would say, well, I think we could talk about this and this and this. And he would say, hmm, no, <laughs> just like, no. And then he would say, let me tell you how I see this as a Palestinian. And, and I, I just think that's such an opportunity, you know, to, to hear someone and, and, a, and a person who's occupied, a person who's coming from a position of occupation and oppression. And how does that, how does that change how you read scripture? It certainly changes it. Um, and I, it, makes me think of all the things that I assume uh, about 
as long as we're talking about this intersectional uh, connection, um, uh, throughout Israel, uh, there, there have been clashes with police protesting the killing of Iyad al Halik. Uh, um, uh, mistakenly shot by uh, border police about a week and a half ago outside Lions Gate uh, in the old city while walking to his special needs school. Um, we are here, of course, so there's been all kinds of protests throughout throughout Israel, Haifa, Jaffa, and other, other places in Israel and in Palestine. Um, we hear, of course, uh, and and at those protests, we've seen signs connecting with Black Lives Matter, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement here. Uh, we here can't can't it can't go unnoticed that uh, uh, as we've seen our the, the, what happened to George Floyd and others, the Israeli military tactics learn from the Israeli military for our, from our, to our police forces, the chokeholds and knees on the neck, et cetera. So these intersectional connections are being made within Israel, within the United States and between the two movements. You wanna say a word about the Yad HaHalik uh, for us uh, and, and the ongoing protests and how it's impacted your congregation and any other connections you wanna make intersectionally? Yeah, so unfortunately, this young man, um, he, Iyad was 32 years old and autistic and was walking, as you said, to his special school, sort of a daycare center for adults. And the police at Lionsgate told him to stop and he didn't understand what, what they wanted him to do and he got frightened. And so he turned and he ran and they shot him eight times. Um, including while he was on the ground. He was on the ground face down and they shot him and he died. And um, it was interesting that that happened around the time of George Floyd's murder. Um, exactly. And you're right, people, people are definitely noticing similarities. I think what's the, the, the very sad similarity of this is that both of these cases are, are so common. And, and that's, you know, we, the, <laughs> George, George Floyd's murder just happened to be caught on video, right? And we know that this sort of violence happens all the time. And, and then the names don't become known and there are no protests. And the same was said here. Um, this man was murdered and he, had, he was not armed. Um, he, he had special needs. There was no reason that he should have been shot the way that he was and killed in the streets. But Palestinians are killed every day in that way all the time and it never makes the news. Um, and I think that's that's the really horrible intersectionality there is that this this is not confined to one place. Um, so we have seen protests here at Black Lives Matters uh, protests. I think I, I have a hard time judging how sincere some of them are. I, I get frustrated um, because I, there are Israelis who are uh, protesting and marching in Tel Aviv and other places. Um, but I just wonder if this is just, if they're just upset because Iyad al-Halak was, uh, had special needs, if you know what I mean, if that's why this, they're, they're willing to stand up and say that this is wrong. Um, are they really, are Israelis really ready to change the system to say that Palestinian lives really matter. Um, if that's the case, then, then we need to get rid of the wall and we need to um, make sure that there is there really is a chance for justice and peace here. Um, so I, I, I'm not trying to be um, too cynical, but it's, it just makes me wonder if it's, if people are just eager to kind of be part of this movement that's going on, be part of this, the, the kind of excitement or is this real? Is there going to be some change? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Well, time will tell. I want to read uh, one of the questions that came from the chat, that come from the chat room, uh, uh, Carrie. Do you think there would be peace if Israel withdrew to the Green Line and no longer occupied Palestinian land? 
How do you address Palestinian Muslims who will never tolerate a Jewish state on, quote, our land, the land of Palestine? Well, I don't know what the, the future is of the two-state solution. What I can tell you is that neither side is willing to have one state. That's a fact. Because, you know, Israelis do not want to give up the dream of a Jewish state. and therefore um, would not accept one state, would not accept incorporating all of the Palestinian cities and territories into um, to be part of Israel, at least not in a way in which everyone received equal rights and equal votes. Uh, and and I, I, in that question, I heard um, someone, whatever, someone said, uh, what, what about Muslims that would never accept? I, I, I mean, I, I think it's true on both sides. There are people who don't, who would never accept um, one state. Mostly what I hear from Palestinians is they say, we would not accept any deal in which we don't have equality, in which we would not have a vote. <laughs> um, so it is really a problem right now, um, especially because we're looking at annexation, if I can just talk about that for a moment. So yeah, we'll we know- Yeah, we'll next question, so I'm glad, please, please. You know, I think, um, in a way, it's just solidifying and, and normalizing what's already happening, what's already happening on the ground. Um, so it's not gonna change daily life very much at all it, to annex these the, the settlements. However, it is just kind of uh, the death knell of, of the two-state solution, it feels at this time. You know, uh, Every time Israel takes more territory, it makes the possibility of a contiguous Palestinian state that less likely. Um, so it's, it, it's not that it's a, a giant change in reality here, but it is sort of showing us this is reality. And, and I was gonna say, I had a conversation about this the other day related to um, what's going on in the US and with, the, with the, our current US president. Um, some people will say that, that that President Trump has caused all of this that's happening, right? Um, and others say, you know, the United States was always heading towards some kind of uprising because we are a racist society and founded upon racist values and history. And it was always going to happen that someday people would rise up and say no more. And maybe Trump just got us there sooner. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm, I, this is something that we, we were having a conversation about. And I think that in a way, that's what's happening here is that we've always been on a path towards annexation. You know, we've had all this talk for decades about peace and two state solution and, and yet no, nothing has really gone forward in that direction. Settlements are, are getting bigger, more and more land is being taken. And maybe now is just that moment where it's becoming real. Um, it's kind of depressing when you think about it that way. Um, that doesn't mean I don't think that we're going to have, that, it doesn't mean I don't have hope. Um, in fact, I'm working on a sermon this week on hope. We'll see how it comes out. But um, I, I think we always have hope and we have hope that, that in the end there will be justice and there will be peace and then we'll have reconciliation. But it's hard to know what that, how we get there from here. Um, that's what I, I don't know. How do we get there? And so the person's question, do you think if we went to the green line, if we, I don't know if that would make peace. It would certainly take us um, in a better direction if we could have agreed upon borders. Um, but just like in the US, uh, as the, that white people are gonna have to give up some privilege, um, in this place, Israelis would need to give up some things. Be willing, they would have to be willing to give up some things in order for there to be equality here and justice here. And that's a hard thing, it's a hard ask. When you preach uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, you take in, you say you write your sermon and you walk around the city and, and you, you first let the Bible speak to you without imposing any of yourself upon it. Then you walk around and you live your life and minister to people and let those concerns that impact the direction of, of the sermon. I know sometimes you furlough in the US, you know, uh, um, 
if you were here today, I mean, you kind of gave a hint about it just in your previous answer, but let's say that we welcomed you to uh, Illinois or Indiana or Texas or back home in Oklahoma um, uh, this Sunday. What would your sermon look like in this context, but knowing what you do about uh, what's happened in, in Jerusalem? Oh my goodness. Um, that's kind of unfair, Michael. <laughs> I don't know. I think, um, well, I am, I am, I, you know, today I was working on my sermon. We have Romans five as one of our readings. And I, so I'm thinking about the relationship of suffering to hope. And, um, I actually, I, I'm not sure what I would say in, I don't know what I'm going to say this week in this context, but what I'm trying to think about is what that relationship is. Right. And, um, and is it and, and how appropriate would it be for me as a white person to stand up and and say to folks, well, you know, suffering produces character and can character produces hope and yeah. hope does not disappoint. I mean, it's it's a tough word right now to people who are suffering. Right. And so I I I don't know quite where that's coming from, but always um, um I would be I would say we can't give up on hope. Um, but it's, I don't know that hope is something that we, that we achieve or that we can just, um, decide to have somehow hope is something that, that we, it's sort of, we walk around in it. It, it exists. It's like, um, well, you know, the water we're swimming in somehow. Um, so I don't know. I don't know exactly what I would say. You know, what, what, uh, um, what impresses me about your answer, and maybe it's a um, maybe it's a uh, an entree, is that you bring a lot of humility to your discussion of hope, and maybe maybe that's what people of privilege. I mean, you know, you're a white woman, uh, uh, American Christian, uh, in that context, and so you know, how how do you speak to indigenous Palestinian? who are who uh, are occupied you know likewise most ministers here haven't haven't walked in the shoes of a george floyd you know i i certainly haven't i haven't walked in a woman's shoes you know i mean i'm a white male of a certain socioeconomic class and of a certain age my god my privilege gets multiplied you know <laughs> multiple t multiple times you know so uh, uh and yet and yet uh the gospel the gospel uh, 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 is a burden upon our hearts to share. And so we approach it very humbly. And that's what impresses me about your answer, Carrie, when you, when you speak about hope. Well, I think that one of the things I've thought about um, just today in this reflecting upon hope is a lot of groups come to Israel and Palestine and they, they will ask me or ask our bishop or the pastors, um, where do you find hope? Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, one time I was sitting with our retired bishop, um, Bishop Yunan, and he he listened to that question and he got really quiet. And then he said, you know, I'm really tired of that question. He said, because I feel that you as Americans come here and you want me to gift you with hope. He said, but your job is to come here and give me hope. He said, you, you, your job is to come here. I am the oppressed and occupied person here. And, um, and you uh, have so much privilege and power and possibility to help us. How about you tell me where my hope is? And I just thought that was such a good answer. And I mean, you should have seen the faces around the room. People just sort of went, ooh. Um, but I think that that's really true, that we shouldn't expect people who are currently suffering to somehow be fonts of wisdom and and hope, um, and I think that might be true for us in, as white people in, in the situation today in the United States. You know, we don't want to try to move our our black and brown friends too quickly towards hope and and um, some spiritualizing their suffering or expecting them to somehow all be Martin Luther King Juniors. You know, it, this is a terrible time 
and there's a lot of pain. And maybe our job is to give others hope, not to expect them to be super hopeful and joyful and <laughs> at this moment. We move too quickly to reconciliation and to um, trying to, to tie everything in a neat little package, I think. That, that was an important and strong word. Uh, um, we, we, ex we, we want, uh, we expect those with the, with, upon whose neck our knee is resting, or at least we're complicit in the knees that are resting on their necks to somehow make us feel better. Right. And uh, um, so you're, that was an important pastoral word to us. Um, we have a question from the chat room, uh, another question, and it, it, uh, um, it impacts me too, because some of my dearest friends uh, in Israel and Palestine are, are, are the Bethlehem Christians, George and Najwa Saada, whose daughter Christine was killed um, by uh, Israeli military hit squad. And also, also Rami Elhanan, uh, whose daughter uh, uh, and Narit uh, Pellet uh, Elhanan, whose daughter Smadar was killed by a suicide bomber at a restaurant not far from the old city. Both of Arami is one of the leaders of the bereaved parents group, and George and Najwa are the most prominent Christian members of the bereaved parents group. We've hosted them here in Fort Wayne. Talk a little bit about the. Uh, do you know much about the bereaved parents organization? And one of the criticisms by some in the activist movement here in the U.S. and around the world is that somehow they normalize in their dialogue with each other. There, they normalize the uh, occupation or they normalize the system of injustice. Um, uh, so talk to us a little bit about the Brief Parents Group and how you and your feelings about them and if you have if you have relationships with any of them. Well, first of all, have you read the book that's that just been written about them, A Paragon? Yes. Yes, very good. Um, yes, I know of the group and then we've had them speak at our church uh, before. I think that normalization is a real thing. And there are some organizations here that I would call normalizing organizations. I would not count parent circle or, or brief parents group to be that. I, I think that- Me either, by the way, me either. Yeah, I, I think it's different because what I have experienced from them is that they're really just sharing their stories and there are no apologies. When, I hear, when I've heard them share their stories, they tell them exactly how they happened and how hard it was and how, awful the deaths of their children were and it's not it's not done apologetically um and i think it's really great i think that anytime we tell our stories that way it changes people so i i but i do but on the issue of normalization i think there are groups that just bring people together for the photo ops essentially um or they're not paying attention to the power dynamics for example so you might have um a group that says, well, we're going to bring Israelis and Palestinian kids together to play basketball or to whatever it is, but they come and they play basketball, but they never go any deeper than that. You know, there's never really any understanding. And at the end of the day, what I've noticed, well, I, I should back up to say uh, my kids went to high school here in Jerusalem. Uh, they went to the Anglican International School. And uh, my older son, Caleb, made friends with uh, a number of Palestinian kids at the school. And then he made friends with some Israeli Jewish kids outside of school through music because he was really into um, uh, like techno music. And he found some friends through um, music groups online. And I was really proud of him. I thought, oh, this is, uh, this is so cool that he is connecting with people in various parts of society here, you know, Palestinians and Israelis, and that was fine. It was all fine until he was a senior in high school and his Israeli friends were preparing to do their military service, which is mandatory here. And he came home one day and said, mom, I just realized that my Israeli friends, um, he didn't say it that way, but he said, my friends, you know, Shahar and he said, they're, they're going to be holding guns pointed at my Palestinian friends next year. Um, 
And, and he, and then he realized that he was not going to have to do any of those things. He was going to get to pick a college and go and do whatever he wanted. Whereas his Palestinian friends didn't have the right of movement and his Israeli friends had mandatory military service. And I think that's what I'm saying is about when you look at um, groups that we would call normalizing, they don't address these types of deeper issues, yeah, systemic, systemic issues. They just try to get people together and say, well, if we just eat homeless together and share a cup of coffee, it'll all be fine. Um, and it's not all fine. We, you might make a friend, but you're still gonna have this systemic injustice issue that hasn't been addressed. Yeah. You know, uh, um, how I have found the bereaved parents just in, 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 in the sheer honesty of sharing their stories and not pulling punches, not apologizing. Um, it, although it's, it's not the same, but, but it's, it, it reminds me of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, where before any reconciliation can take place at all, an honest sharing of stories Mm. And 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 uh, uh, maybe even uh, 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 an asking of forgiveness, uh, but but a, an honest sharing of personal stories, so it humanizes the other. Uh, uh, that that's a, a necessary first step, and uh, uh, that's what has impressed me about the bereaved parents group more than anything else. Let me ask you. Uh, um, um, you, you're finding still the presence of Christian Zionism uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, what, what's the what's the what's the impact of Christian Zionism in uh, in the Holy Land these days? Is it growing? Has it plateaued? I mean, what's your what's your experience of Christian Zionist movements there? I don't I don't know how I don't know if I could say whether it's growing or not. It's definitely still a huge um, movement, you know, a huge ideology here and mostly coming from the outside, you know, it's really uh, so many American Christians that come here with ideas that um, they need to support Israel so that Jesus will come back sooner. And, and you know, if you're familiar with Christian Zionism at all, you know that this is, um, it's really dangerous to this place and to the people of this place, because it's not really this ideology is not really seeing the people in this place today, but it's making Jerusalem fit in to um, this construct that people have, this theological construct. But you know, it's not, go ahead. No, please go ahead. It's not just outsiders. I mean, it is here there. Um, for example, the school that my children went to, the Anglican school is actually very Zionist, Christian Zionist school at its at its core, the board is um, quite Christian Zionist. Um, and so it's it's here, you know, it's a, it's definitely impacted here. That's what I was, I guess that's what I was trying to get at too, because uh, I remember about a year or two before uh, Bishop Yunnan uh, retired, uh, he, he, he was a longtime friend. And so uh, we sat in his office, um, and had a long conversation. And he talked to me about how more and more the indigenous Christian community there was being impacted. And even he didn't use the word convert, but that there were more and more indigenous Palestinian Christians who were exhibiting these theological mm. views. There and are I some. I, was, I guess I was wondering if you're finding that to be the case anymore. Yeah, I mean, there are, there's even a, there's a pastor in Bethlehem, a Palestinian pastor in Bethlehem, who is um, very Christian Zionist. And um, so it, it's, yeah, it has infiltrated into the culture here. I don't have as much day-to-day -day contact with folks like that, you know, because typically these groups are not coming to Redeemer when they come <laughs> to visit. Um, but it definitely is, is impacting people. Are there, here's, here's another question, uh, coming back to one of the things you talked about before. Um, are there Jewish protests against annexation happening? Where's the uh, Jewish peace movement, the Jew, so-called Israeli left or Jewish left? Are there any uh, Israeli protests against annexation? 
There have been in the last few weeks, yeah, and in Tel Aviv and a little bit here in Jerusalem. Um, so I've been really pleased to see that. It is very small, and most folks here will talk about the, the disappearing or already disappeared Israeli left. Um, I mean, the, the government here has swung very right wing, and even the, the, the groups that are supposedly moderates are actually very, very right wing. Um, yeah. So that's just the the shift all the way. But there, the, you know, the Israeli left is there. I just think they're they're so small now. Um, it's hard for them to make an impact. I just have a a couple more questions for you, Carrie. Uh, again, I appreciate your time. You're up late uh, on a Thursday evening, and uh, we appreciate your presence here. Uh, on the feast of the Ascension uh, a few weeks ago, you said the following. We're not returning to life post COVID-19 because there is no such thing. There's only a life with COVID-19, at least for now. So catch us up with uh, life with COVID-19 today on Thursday and the reopening of businesses, institutions, holy sites. What's the status of Redeemer Church these days? Uh, talk to us about life with COVID-19 in your world. So we opened up for worship um, three weeks ago. Uh, and I wanna say uh, we were in a very different place than the United States at that time. We had only, uh, we had new cases in the single digits every day in all of Israel. So, you know, we had uh, five new cases a day or for a couple of days, none at all. So at that time, things started to open. Uh, we have, we do temperature checks at the door we, everyone's required to wear a mask, especially for singing. So they stay, they keep it on all the time. Um, social distancing. And uh, social distancing, which is not a hard thing right now because I only have about 20 congregation members left in the country because so many of my congregation members are international diplomats or, or uh, workers and that were, they were called back to their home countries. Uh, any tourists at all? I mean, no, any? no one is allowed in. The, oh, okay. no, no, yeah, no one's allowed into the country unless they are citizens or can prove that their center of life is here. Um, and, and even then, if you come in from anywhere else, you have to be in quarantine for two weeks. So it's still very, very closed down. We have no tourists. Interestingly, we, are, we do have tourists in the old city and they are Israelis from other parts of the country. So that's been interesting. Um, you know, often if, if you talk to Israelis who live in the north, you know, live in Tel Aviv or other places, they'll say, oh, how can you live in Jerusalem? It's, they, they just think Jerusalem's weird and religious and conservative, which it kind of is. Uh, <laughs> and um, so they think, why would you go there? Some, some Israelis have only been here once in their lives, you know? Um, but now they're coming because the tourists are gone and it's kind of a, an interesting time. You can walk through the old city with no crowds whatsoever. And um, so, yeah, that's been interesting to see. Uh, life with COVID, I'll tell you. So our, our church is open. Our church office is op in operation. Um, our The other congregations, though, of the ELCJHL are really struggling financially because the the economy of the West Bank is totally based on tourism. It's it's totally about tourism in Bethlehem and in these areas. So if you don't have tourists, people don't have jobs. And if people don't have jobs, then they're not paying the tuition for their kids to go to our schools, which means and the schools are also the way that the church is sustainable and pays other employees. I mean, we it's really just a, a it's a dire situation to the point that we are, we are paying our teachers, but I think now after, after next month, they'll go down to 50% salary, even though they've been teaching online, they've continued to teach, as you know, and will continue. Um, and we have families we've needed to help with real basic needs with them, um, just buying groceries and keeping power on. So Shops it- open at all? Shops open at all or anything? Shops are open. Yeah, grocery stores are open. Um, restaurants have started to open uh, with outdoor seating. 
schools are in session. Schools went back about a month ago, but unfortunately now we've had a huge climb in the number of cases. So we're back up to about 180 to 200 new cases per day. Yeah. Uh, whereas we were, as I said, we were down to five per day or, or fewer. You know, uh, there was a question early on that I wanted to make sure we got to, and that is uh, how can we support uh, your ministry or the other ministries in uh, uh, in Jerusalem? So thank you for asking that. A couple of things. First of all, the way to support me to make sure that I get to stay here and, and do my work is through ELCA Global Mission. And there's actually a direct link um, where you can uh, give in any amount to just to support my ministry. It's not like it goes into my pocket, by the way. It, go <laughs> it goes to Global Mission and funds um, it, to all, all the missionaries, but it's it's helpful if you put there that it came from, um, you put Carrie Ballinger and then it, it, um, it helps. Uh, but if you want to help the, the church here, the Palestinian Lutheran churches here and uh, with what I just told you about, um, there's a group called Opportunity Palestine, which was formed initially, it's a 501c3 in the United States. It was formed to just help the schools and a, a way for Americans to easily be able to give to, um, and that was going towards scholarships for the Lutheran schools. Now in the midst of this COVID crisis, um, anything that's given to Opportunity Palestine will go to the church, to ELCJHL and go to the, the greatest need. And sometimes right now, the greatest need has been really buying food for the church families and making sure that they have basics. So um, that's really appreciated. If you know anybody that, that would like to help in that way, just try uh, yeah, opportunitypalestine.org, I believe. Okay, thank you. Um, give us a word about uh, what, what you see as the role of the Christian church in the US um, regarding Israel and Palestine. Most of the people who are online here, I, I mean, I don't know everyone who's here, but most of the folks who I see here belong to Christian churches, Christian denominations. What do you see as the role of the Christian church to be as helpful as possible? Well, I, I always appreciate knowing that people are praying for us here, you know, just including Palestinian Christians in your prayers. Um, I think that's really helpful. Christians here will often say they feel forgotten by West, the West um, and forgotten in conversations about Israel and Palestine because people will talk about Palestinians and, they, and, and I think that the image that comes to people's mind is, is a Muslim and, um, and they forget that there are actually Christians here. I think the other way to be helpful is to combat things like Christian Zionism when you, when you encounter them in your theology or among your church members, um, and especially combating these dehumanizing stories that you might hear when people will say, well, you know, all the Muslims, all the Palestinians just want to push Israel into the sea, or when you hear things like that, that you know not to be true, especially those of you who have been here and have seen it, to really just speak up and say, you know, that is not, um, that's not my experience. That's not who I met. That's not, you know, there are Christians and Muslims and Jews here who want peace and want justice and want reconciliation. Um, I think that's just important to combat it. Just as we step up when we hear a racist joke, it's not a joke, right? You stand up and you, you say something. Same, I would love to have, uh, I would love to see Christians in America doing the same thing about Israel and Palestine and really, um, and the same goes for anti-Semitism. I mean, we have, we have plenty of that going through the church as well. It sure. shows up in our sermons often. Last question. Mm. Um, uh, you, you kind of uh, touched on it earlier, but I thought I'd give you a chance to maybe kind of uh, uh, expand upon your answer. We're in an election year. Uh, here in the U.S. Donald Trump has uh, been a disaster for the Palestinian cause, but Joe Biden's uh, political history is one of unconditional support for the state of Israel. So as someone who ministers uh, to those who deal with the impact, the brunt in many ways of U.S. unconditional support for Israel, 
give us a, a pastoral word about our role as citizens uh, in, the, in the next few months? Mm. <laughs> well, I think it's good that you point out that um, our the, the Democratic candidate for president also doesn't have a great record on Israel-Palestine. I think that's good. And, and that, to be fair, uh, people here are not too excited about Barack Obama either because he didn't Absolutely. go far enough or do. So, I mean, uh, we can't pretend that if you just vote Democrat, everything's going to be fine. I think the role, our role right now is to push, it seems that Biden is going to be the, the candidate, right? So to push his campaign and his team to go further and to um, really push push him to to pay attention to the cause here. Um, but I don't know that there's much you can do except to do that, to lobby, to get out and vote, make sure people vote. Um, I wish I had a better pastoral word for you. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe we uh, wait for my sermon on Sunday. I, I should have something to say about hope by then. And then you... <laughs> Hope in the midst of suffering. It wasn't just any old hope. It was hope in the midst of suffering, Carrie. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, uh, well, uh, thanks. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give Carrie the last word, uh, but before I do, uh, Indiana Center for Middle East Peace is supporting the Poor People's Campaign virtual march on Washington, D.C. on Saturday morning, June the 20th. So we're, we're really uh, a part of that. Uh, I'm part of the prophetic council. Uh, a number of our folks are very involved with the Poor People's Campaign. So check out the Poor People's Campaign website, website for the Zoom link. Uh, originally, as you know, the Poor People's Campaign was gonna converge uh, tens and tens and tens of thousands of people on the nation's capital on, on June the 20th. With the uh, uh, pandemic quarantine now, we're doing a virtual march on Washington. So check out uh, the Zoom link for the Poor People's Campaign virtual website for Saturday morning, June the 20th. We'll also be continuing our series of interviews with other peacemakers in the coming weeks. And we'll be, uh, we'll be making those uh, interview times and dates available to those on our activist network and we'll let you know. So Pastor Carrie Ballinger, it's just a delight to spend time with you, Carrie. Uh, thanks for coming today. Any, any parting words for us? Thanks for asking me and thanks for all that you're doing. And uh, I think it's just wonderful. I looked at the lineup of speakers and people you've been hearing from and I, what a wonderful organization you have and offering this to people um, online is, is it's an unexpected blessing of this time, isn't it? This uh, opportunity to connect across boundaries even further. And um, I, I think the last thing I, I want to say is, you know, Jerusalem is known as the holy city, but my experience has been that um, what I've learned the most is that every city is holy, every place is holy. And this place is no more holy than Indiana, uh, Oklahoma, I see Karen Fowler Linda Mulder over there, so I know Oklahoma is on the line. I just think we we need to remember that that God is with us everywhere, in every place, in every time, and uh, thank God for that. <laughs>